Welcome to the next podcast on Millinery at Bow. I'm your host, Lauren Ritchie. Thank you for joining me today with this episode with Georgia Skelton. Georgia is the winner of the Millinery Association of Australia Design Award. I'd like to thank our wonderful podcast sponsors for making this episode possible. Be Unique Millinery, House of Adorn, The Essential Hat, That Millinery, Hatter's Millinery Supplies, Lifted Millinery, Hat Academy, Hats by Lico, Hat Mags, Marie D'Antoni Millinery, Louise McDonald Milliner, the Millinery Association of Australia, and Judith M. Millinery Supply House. You can find a link to each of their businesses in our show notes. You can do this through your favourite podcast app or our website. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast series, I'd like to invite you to show your support through becoming a Patreon. There are two tiers available. You can be a podcast sponsor or just a supporter. You can find out more or sign up at www.patreon.com forward slash millinery info. I hope you enjoy this episode with Georgia. Thank you so much, Georgia, for joining me today on the Millinery Info podcast. It's wonderful to have you here today. Um, oh, you're welcome. You are the winner of the Millinery Association 2021 Design Award. Um, I am. Let's, <laughs> let's start there. Could you tell us about your piece? Oh, the piece. Okay, so I was um, a bit of a loss of what to do and, and my mum had just passed away and those of you that know me know how much, I, you know, my mum and I were very close and, and I'm an op shop lover and I was... Um, in Savers in Moorabbin um, and I just walked and I saw this jumper and it was a daggy jumper um, but the but the fabric the fibre that it was made from I just I didn't know what I didn't sort of jump out of me design award but I just thought that jumper's coming home with me like I knew that that would be be something and I think with mum just passing like I didn't really have the the competition in me I was just like I didn't really but I but I you know I believe we have to support these events because if we don't they won't happen and um especially you know at the moment where you know millinery you know it's probably on the last on a lot of people's lists with you know COVID and you know all that and I thought we need to support the millinery industry and so I needed to, I knew I needed to do the competition so I just decided I wouldn't worry about competing and just create something that I enjoyed. And um, so everything was recycled, which um, I love. Um, and the, the, so the jumper, it, it draped beautifully, but, the, it, but I needed to obviously undo areas, re-knit areas, and there was crochet in it and uh, needle lacing, which... Um, it's an old old technique, but it's it's a very a very handy one, which I you know recently sort of got reminded of by you know the, at the embroidery guild, which I'm a member of and love, and um, yeah, it all just came together, and I absolutely loved it. And when I finished it, it feels beautiful in the hand as well, like it it's a love. Well, I think it does anyway. But when I finished it, I just thought it didn't matter. It didn't matter. The competition didn't matter. I had completed completed it under very difficult circumstances and I, I thought mum would have loved it. And the only disappointing thing was you know, I didn't get to show mum, you know, it was like because I always have had show and tell with mum for years, you know, and, and she's she's a very honest critic. <laughs> like, very honest critic. So, um, yeah, I, I love, I really enjoyed making it and um, I was I was shocked, to, to tell you the truth, I was shocked because I didn't, I, I, because I wasn't worrying about the competition, I didn't have all that self doubt or anything. Because I was just making it because I loved it, and I, you know, and you know, no offense, Lauren, but I really didn't care whether you liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm glad that you did. And, yeah, it just is. So you know, it was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the theme was 1920s, and yours was uh, inspired by the aviation of the 1920s. Right. How did you, from that jumper that you picked up, it's a, like a silver metallic finish yeah. knit. Yeah. Um, how, how did you get to this amazing aviatrix aviation inspired piece? 
Oh God, I don't know how that how that came, but the so it, it was a separate. It was separate. So I had the jumper, and then I started, you know, just you know, googling the era that I because I wanted to do the the nineteen twenties. Um, and I so, so good. And then I just there was a, an image I saw that looked a bit metallic. You know, you could see it looked a little bit metallic, and that's when it sort of clicked together. I thought, oh, what is that metallic jumper? could work with that metallic thing. And, and then the sunglasses, well, you know, cause I wanted the, but I thought I just can't add sunglasses because then that's not really a melon, that's not really millinery. So when I found the sunglasses, you know, I did, I, you know, pulled everything apart except for the lenses and they were needle laced on both sides um, of the, of the lens. And then the strap was, um, I think it, that was knitted, I think, was that crocheted? I can't remember now. Um, and so it was wearable. So you could actually take the, girl, the goggles from the top of the hat and put them on. And they looked all right. I wouldn't want to be wearing them all day for comfort. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> at least they were, I, I thought, well, you know, you, you can't have something that's just not, not usable if it's going to be yeah, there. So, um, yeah, so it was an image that sort of struck me that of being metallic and then me having this metallic, to get them up, that's when it clicked together and and it was you know when you you create when you're trying to create something and you're clueless and then you, you go from a to b and you your whole your whole studio's i don't know about this i'm just describing my work ethic and your whole studio has been torn apart because you're thinking oh no that'll work that won't work and then all of a sudden you have that moment that oh and everything comes together and you go oh my god this is what i'm going to do this is brilliant <laughs> and i had that moment you know and i felt that mum was uh, watching going yeah this is this is a good one georgia you know that's that's the way to do it yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, so the competition like you know when every time i enter a competition i used to show mum my piece and she would say you know that this is going to be a winner and you know the the, the facebook members page i every year i used to <laughs> put on the Facebook members page just showing mum my hat and you know she said oh, I've got it in the bag and and then when I didn't win I would say you know you know mum says the judges need their head red you know so it was always a big joke you know and then so when I did win it was beautiful that the messages I got from the the members of the association who knew that I'm going to cry again but who knew you know the that I'd lost mum and they were saying, oh, you know, things like, oh, your mum was watching from heaven and, you know, your mum got it right this year. And it was lovely, you know, it's, it, it was it was lovely. So, yeah. Fantastic. And such a wonderful support for your creative yeah. you know, endeavours and all that you do. Oh, Fantastic. Yeah, she, she was, um, I've never seen better with a needle and thread my mum, you know, and, you know, I was brought up with, um, should I unpick it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> If you're asking the questions, the yeah. problem, the answer is probably yes. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it. Whereas if you have to ask if you need to unpick it, well, you probably do, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So let's jump back to the beginning. How did you first become involved in millinery? Oh, well, that's a, a story. Um, so I was, uh, I, I started sewing like six, age of six. <laughs> Um, and I was helping by the time I was eight or nine, I was helping mum on the sewing machine with the um, school fate stuff. And, you know, I was putting zips in the pencil cases for the, the Hyatt primary school fate. And um, so I just always loved sewing. And then I, I started embroidering very young, crocheted um, very young, knitted very young. And, um, and then when I met my husband, he was... Um, into, he really enjoyed horse racing and my mum took me to um Ula La, which was a shop in the city I don't know whether you're old enough Lauren to know that store but some of your listeners will remember it Ula La in the city and um she wanted to buy me a hat and I didn't want to wear a hat it was um I was 22 I think and I didn't want to wear a hat I made my own clothes and everything but I didn't want to wear a hat mum said oh you've got to wear a hat to the races and and this was a it, mum wasn't um, wasn't a spender, you know. We were brought up not poor. We had enough, you know. But mum worked in a factory, and dad was a garbage man. But and I was one of seven children, so there wasn't a lot of money flowing around, as, you know, growing up when I was, you know, around. But so for her wanting this hat, you know, I remember. I think it was. Look, I might be wrong with the price. It might have been one hundred and fifty dollars or something, and it was a lot of money I put for a hat. And I thought I'm never going to wear it again, you know. I was like, oh, so. Um, 
I didn't buy the hat, but I went to the op shop and I got a hat and I dressed it up and we were in a, you know, fancy, fancy marquee. It was one of the very first VIP events my husband and I ever did. And um, I sat next to this lady who was wearing the hat from Ooh La La. And all I could think of was, thank God I didn't buy that hat from Ooh La La. And so I knew that if I was going to wear a hat, it had to be custom. You know, you know, I was much more comfortable in the op shop hat that I had, you know, made, made your own. You made my own for. And I knew that um, there's always that risk if you, if you buy off the shelf, you could be sitting next to the same shelf, you know. So that was, um, you know, how I sort of knew millinery came into my life. Um, then when I was, because um, I've always sewn, and so when I was 40, I know you're thinking, looking at me now, oh, for, for your viewers, I don't look Yesterday. Like <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> but when I was 40, because uh, I've always sewn, but, um, and my mother who, you know, she's sewn, she, she was working in a factory at the age of 12 making clothes. So I've always sewn, but that, there was something about having a piece of paper, you know, that says, yes, you know how to do this that gives a person or gives me, gave me confidence. And mum never had confidence, even though she was so talented and highly skilled. And so I decided I would go to um, TAFE and I did um, a diploma in clothing, clothing construction and fashion design and uh, some of the foot, te foot shoe technology, but I never really covered that. I don't know whether that's, whether that's even on the certificate. But, and I did it part-time because I had the kids and everything. And that gave me the confidence um, that I needed to back me, and I started to making started to making clothing for the races for women going to the races. That was, um, you know, my start. And of course, and I thought, well, you know, if I'm doing this, I should add the the millinery. And uh, my I have a friend in who's in Geelong, Rose. Hi, Rosemary, if you're listening, <laughs> Rosemary Grant. And she had um, she had done some courses with Louise McDonald, um, but she. Um, she, she'd had enough of it, you know, she, she, was, she, she didn't want to do it professionally, she just did it for fun. And she said, oh, if you're going to do millinery, you know, would you like some of my, st my stuff, you know? And I thought she meant, you know, like a Tupperware container of feathers or something. And I said, oh, that'd be lovely. That'd be lovely. And anyway, she drove down and, and she gave me um, some blocks and a, a steamer wow. and a whole lot of cinema and like all sorts, like amazing, like a lot of stuff. And so my, so my first year at um, Kangan Institute, I didn't have to spend any money. So I made sure I just used everything she gave me. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to use everything she gave me. I didn't want to sort of, you know, invest too much money just to see if I, if I wasn't any good at it. But I, I really, um, I really liked it. Um, and so that, you know, I was able to then sell the, the clothing and, and the millinery. And then the millinery sort of took over um, um, because look, millinery is is it has its challenges to create, but making clothing has, as you know, Lauren, making clothing for for women um, has different challenges. And you know, um, I can remember a woman coming in with a, a she was about she was in her fifties and short and frumpy, and she came in with a photo of the of um, Megan Gale, not Megan Gale. Um, oh, one of the young supermodels of Australia. I can't remember her name now. She's gone. But she was on the front cover in this short mini skirt and she brought in this thing. She said, this is, this is her inspiration for her piece, you know. And, um, yeah, so dealing with, you know, women's complex on their bodies and, and all that is, is, is challenging. But, you know, the, head, the head's a whole different thing. So, um, so the, the millinery took over. And, but, um, you know, I had a little shop in Bentley uh, for three years and I sold the, the, the clothing made the hats and also had my secondhand dealer's license. So I had um, vintage jewelry. So you could sort of do the whole and handbags and things. You could sort of do the whole thing. So um, yeah, that's how it also came about, you know, just from my, my husband loving the horses and he still loves the horses. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So but we don't get to go. <laughs> hmm. And would you go to the races yourself a lot with your husband? Um, the main the main drags we go to Launceston um my husband started sponsoring the Launceston Cup many many years ago um he sponsored the main the main race um the main not the main event um back when it was called the, the liquor for less Launceston Cup when the liquor for less, the Launceston Cup was struggling 
and my husband, um, you know, helped them build it up again. Um, and, you know, it was, um, you know, very fancy and the Melbourne Cup, very fancy, Caulfield Cup, the main, the main ones I did. Um, I don't enjoy crowds, Lauren, so it's not something that, you know, I go, oh, I can't wait to get there. I, I get a bit anxious in crowds, but um, we always lucky to have, you know, the nice spots, you know, to go, the marquees and all that. So that was, you know, a toilet, you know, a, a nice <laughs> toilet is always, always good to have. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you feel inspired to, will you make an outfit, especially for the occasion, or will you um, uh, oh, yeah. style something you've already got? Yeah. Um, less these days like it was like it's like you know when um you're making for others you end up running out of time for yourself I always wear wear a hat though like that I've either made myself or one one year I wore a vintage hat that was given to me to the ones which I just loved um you know I make I make a hat for myself and when if I've got time I'll you know make something but you know or I'll, I'll go to the op shop and restyle something which is what you know I love I love a good find you know I love a hunt love a good hunt and what I love about the op shops is um you know you just don't know what you're going to find whereas if you go to you know to the chatty you know what you're going to find it's in the magazines you know it's already there so I might base up buy something and then alter it change it and you know whatever but occasionally I'll go and buy something new but normally I, I, prefer, I go to the op shop first uh, if I haven't got time to make it when you're hunting in the op shops, what are there, is there anything in particular that you look for, or what stands yeah. out to you? How do you know you're on a winner? <laughs> I go, I go to colour. So I don't. I mean, I, I, I'm like a scanner at the op shop. You know, I'll start. I go, like I'll bip through all, and, go, and something will jump out. Oh, what, what, what's that? And then you know, I just see, you know, how much fabric's in it first. So it doesn't matter of, of the style of it. Like if there's enough fabric, I go, oh, I could take the the collar off that. Uh, the collar and cuffs off that, add, add a bit of lace and boom, boom, that looks pretty cool. So, you know, if I can alter it, that's what I do. And, um, yeah, so I don't worry about the size of it, just the, the colour and how much fabric's in it that I could, you know, manipulate. Hmm. Interesting approach. That's great. Um, and how do you think your textile knowledge, you've got a lot of skills in, um, like, lace making, you mentioned, and embroidery and um, garment construction. How does that influence how you approach millinery initially actually the first five or six years I approached my millinery as a seamstress and that did me a disservice um, because I, I couldn't I took me a while to disconnect from something that goes in the laundry like the the amount when you sew something or the seams you know, everything, you know, the grain really, mat really, really matters because if you cut it, you know, slightly off grain and it goes in the laundry, you know, it'll come out completely skew with. And then I was, I was spending too much time finishing internal seams that were never going to be seen. Like I did a, a lot and that added a bit of bulk to my work when I look back. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, I click. I thought, "Hang on a second, you know, this is the mill I'm milliner. This is, you know, doing the millinery. This doesn't have to have a, a French seam in this corner." You know, like it's like, so yeah, it did affect it in a a I won't say a negative way, but just uh, I made it harder for myself originally. Um, and then once I could let go of that and just say, "Hang on, just it's a hat. It's just not going to go through the wash." Um, you know, it's a little bit different. It made it a bit easier. But my my fabric knowledge and the way I can look at something and see how it will behave, I think is handy. But I, I do um, a lot more fabric covered hats than the majority of milliners that I know, I think, because I, I love fabrics. You know, I love, um, I don't like straw as much. I love fabric, you know. I love to look at a beautiful silk or or a velvet and just think, oh, that, you know, what's that? And when it gets stiffened, I think, what a shame. <laughs> you know, so I like I like fabric. So that's where I sort of, you know, go to. And and when I'm doing a competition piece, I'll start off, uh, like up until recently, I, I started off trying to really stick with just pure, um, more, more millinery. And then I always end up back with fabric. So I just always end up back with fabric and manipulating them in some way. Hmm. 
Um, so from having the shop, um, where do you now work? Do you still have the shop open? No, no, I don't have the shop. When I opened the shop, I, I, um, I loved it. And what I wanted, I didn't really want a shop. I wanted a studio out of my home because at the time where we were living, um, the boys said they were going to move out, but they sort of didn't. And then uh, I just ended up, you know, we had a, a beautiful formal lounge and formal dining room in our house, beautiful, like, and it was just my mess, you know. Um, so I thought I didn't really want a shop, I wanted a studio, but I found this studio shop. And I thought, oh, what a great idea to have a shop win. Like I've got a big window, it's on a main sort of main drag, but and then I could work from there. But it backfired a bit because um, it was at a bus stop. And so if it was raining, people would just come into the shop, you know, to avoid the rain. Oh, hey, what's something good to get? I have to be nice and chat, you know, chat to people who had no interest in really what I was doing, you know. And um, I also discovered I love. I, I'm the sort of person, if I get an idea um, at 10.30 at night, I, I sort of have to see, I have to sort of put a bit in place before I go to bed. Oh, I wonder if, I wonder if I've got any of that. And I'll go through my stuff and, and I'll sort of spread it all out, the and, you know, midnight. And I'm thinking, oh, but now, okay, now I've got an idea, I'll go to bed. Whereas, so when, what I mean is when inspiration strikes, I like to be able to just act on it. And having the shop hours meant that I had to be there, whether, whether I was inspired or not, you know. Um, so I would have been better off without just, just having the window blocked off and just working there. When I think back, I could have done it differently. So after three years, my, my, um, some, one of my sons did move out and I thought, well, I won't renew the lease, old little studio. And then we've moved house now and I've got a nice, um, a nice space you know, completely chandelier and everything, a very inspiring little studio that I have in, in my home. So, um, but I still, you know, I work the weirdest hours. Like, you know, there's, if I'm if I'm inspired, you won't stop me. And, um, but I'm lucky I can sleep when I want, what in, you know, I can make my own hours, so. Fantastic. And you do a bit of teaching. When did that first start and how did that well, evolve? Yeah, well, teaching, my very first time I ever taught anybody was my little sister, um, and she was, I, I can remember it like yesterday, I think I might have been 10, so she would have been maybe seven and a half or eight, and she was very sick, and um, I must have probably been whinging to mum, I suppose, and mum gave me some needles and some brown wool to teach your sister to knit, and uh, and I just love teaching my little sister to knit. Hi, Louise. Um, yeah, and so it's my first time I ever taught anybody, and then... Um, the next time I taught something, my mum, back in the, would have been back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, there was a, you know how crafts go through crazes, you know, like there's the, the scrapbookers and it, there's a little period of, of history for each little craft. Well, there was the teddy bear making craze. And uh, my mother had given me a, a kit um, to make a teddy bear and I and I made this teddy bear of the kit and I tell you Lauren it was like I'd given birth I seriously absolutely loved making this teddy bear so I became quite obsessed with making the teddy bear and my um, my mother my grandmother had passed away my dad's mum and she left behind a, a fake fur coat but she was she was such a tiny woman it would have been a size four or six you know and uh, so nobody wanted the coat, but I thought oh, I'll make I'll make teddy bears out of it for the like heirlooms. So I made teddy bears, and I got first prize in the Royal Melbourne Show for my teddy bear. And um, and Mum said, oh, you should teach, you know. And so I made this little. Um, it was called the birth of a teddy bear, and I made this course, and I taught I taught in my home and at and at the one of the community centres, you know, teddy bears, and I just loved the whole process of putting the notes together, and um, you know, the the materials together that that they need, the creating of the patterns. I love the whole process of teaching, and I love when you're teaching someone, and they're confused, and then they get it. And they have that beautiful aha moment. I love that. Uh, I, I, I love telling people to unpick. 
that and then they're faced when they've done it again and they realize why they were told to unpick and that, and they realize that they've got more skill than they thought you know that yes. I just I, I teaching is one of my favorite things to do and um then when I was when I was at, um, at at the end of the lease at the shop I was asked um box I was got a phone call from Box Hill Institute which is where I did my fashion training asking if I was interested in teaching CAD computer-aided drawing and um I, I loved computer-aided uh, drawing I thought oh yeah I'll do that yeah why not so I thought I had an interview so but I already had the job so I was like cool so I just sort of you know rocked up and um, so my first um, of like professional teaching for others was at Box Hill Institute with CAD and then I gradually sort of um, you know like mould <laughs> I grew over the Box Hill Institute <laughs> and I, I taught every subject except computer pattern making I think it was I taught the pattern making the design classes the sewing classes fabric manipulation class every every subject just about um you know I I taught and I was there for quite a few years and and really loved it and then I um I went to RMIT um and I was teaching the beginners sewing um one night a week and I look I love that and I would still be there today except it the the drive from my place to RMIT like it was so unpredictable like the traffic I'd have to I'd have to allow two and a half hours just in case just in case there was because there was an accident on the freeway or it was just and you're for context of those listening you're you're in Melbourne and RMIT is in it's in Melbourne (laughs) the very first day you know I was almost late you know and I just thought how could I possibly I allowed so much time how could I possibly because you know I don't like to be late I think you know no one does but I really don't like to be late so yeah that that was um there and then I went to um I taught it at CAE at adult education and I taught at um Holmes Glen for a very short period of time um yeah it was um a different group of people it was um I'll figure what they're called you know high schoolers a couple of kids in the class that just were trouble like this one I thought oh god seriously <laughs> this is just too hard and and mum and dad were um we were getting putting them in aged care at the time and it was all just too hard for me to be doing that so I just thought well I'll I'll I thought then on the way home from one day from teaching I thought oh what I I don't look I love teaching but I don't like all the paperwork that goes with the teaching at a at a, a TAFE and the auditing and the the hours and hours that you have to put in afterwards and I thought oh maybe I just design a course that um has all the good bits of a TAFE but um, not all the other bits. So it's won't, it won't be a, a recognised qualification, but, it, but someone who wants to learn millinery, they'll get the basics, you know, of this. And that's when, um, you know, I started Melbourne School of Millinery. And, you know, I really enjoyed putting all it together and the classes I enjoyed. And we had, you know, lunch here and um, it was lovely. But when COVID hit, you know, and you got the social distancing and all, it was just, um, it just wasn't, so it's on hold now. I don't know what will happen, you know, with that now. Like it's, um, you know, people have said to me, why don't you do online, you know, teach online? Because I don't like teaching online. You know, I like to sit over someone's shoulder and say, unpick that. (laughs) (laughs) It's very hard to tell someone to unpick over Zoom, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you know, it's... um, I don't know. I don't know how I would get the same quality as I get from standing next to someone saying, "No, that's not right." I'll show you again. No, no. Look at my fingers. Now see where my thumb is. Now can you can you see that little ridge? Put your needle between that little ridge. Do you see it? I don't see how I'd be able to do that on an online. Maybe I, maybe some can, but I, I I just don't think I'd enjoy it. And I'm at a time in my life now where I don't have to do much that I don't enjoy. Um, you know, it's 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 a good time. Like you know, you know, it's like life's of all about climbing up a hill. And you hear people say that you're over the hill. And I used to think you know over the hill was an awful thing, but over the hill it's much easier on the way down. You know, it really is. So I don't mind saying I'm over the hill. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but so I would um, you know when I, we 
when we open up again, I'll probably have, you know, more one-on-one -on -one classes, like private tuition. Um, I think that that would be, you know, more, more up my alley now. Um, yeah, so, but I, but I still, I, I love to teach and, and, and I'll always will, I think. I'll always be a teacher. But my granddaughter, um, when she came along, my, my step-granddaughter, I, I thought, oh, this is, this is going to be great. I'm going to, she's going to sit next to me saying, teach me, Nana, teach me, teach me. Oh, it's just going to be wonderful. And I said to her, you know, would you like to learn how to knit? And she said, yes. And um, so I taught her how, she did five stitches. And she goes, oh, know how to do it now. Oh, she ran. <laughs> She wasn't interested in knitting. She just said, oh, yeah, I can tick that box. I know how to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so she wasn't that keen. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping at some stage, you know, that someone comes along in the family that uh, that is keen, yeah. <laughs> to, to sit and stitch with you for more than yeah, five stitches. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and working in your studio space, how do you have your space set up with all your different creative and textile? Okay, so... Up until recent, so I've got a lot of lovely shelving. Um, one of the the items of shelving I have, it's I, I, I got it from eBay, and when I put it together, I thought this is stunning. And I've since discovered it's actually quite a famous sort of bit of furniture. I can't remember the name, but I've got lots. Of, so my studio is surrounded by shelving, and I have um, all my bits and bobs in clear plastic containers so that I can clearly see you know what I have and I when I'm in when I was you know full on into the millinery and the teaching of the millinery the blocks took pride to place because um you know with the students they could see but since COVID I was kept coming into the studio and I'd see the blocks and they actually started to depress me because they weren't really being used um I was thinking, oh, I should be making a hat. I'm thinking, but what for? Like all, every, all the events are shut. Uh, I can't teach anybody. And I so would, so I had such a feel like a sadness when I came in my studio. So what, I've moved all the blocks into the spare room wardrobe. So they're still very accessible. Like they're only a couple of feet away, but they're out of my vision. And when I did that, when I changed that, it lightened. So my studio became an inspiring space again. So I have um, all my fabrics uh, or my sewing fabrics are all out so I can see them all, which I love them. I, <laughs> I, you know, what's that saying? She who dies with the most fabric wins. I think, you know, maybe I'm on, on course, you know, <laughs> for that. Um, and some of the fabrics have actually come, you know, secondhand as well. Not, not all because a little, little trick when you're buying, you know, fabric, um, from an op shop or something, you've got to smell it. <laughs> it um, I always smell it, and no amount of cleaning. I, you know, I know there's vinegar and all sorts of things can get the smell of mothballs and oldness out. But I don't buy fabric like that. Like if I have to put that much work in to making it not smell, I'm not interested. Um, but you know, I've got some some beautiful fabrics, and um, I've started making. So during lockdown, I started making clothes for myself again. Uh, which I've, you know, gee, I thought, God, I really miss that, you know. And um, but you know, I was making myself a dress for um, for a wedding, and you know, um, so I, I I cut it all out, and I was looking, what size will I cut out? And I thought, oh, look, I'm a little bit heavier than I was pre-COVID, so I thought I'll make the next size, and I thought, oh, but I'll make the next size after that, just in case. <laughs> so, so I've ended up with this way too big, <laughs> it's way big, but you know, I'm, it's fine, but. Um, and I've got a wedding dress that you know um, is um, that I'm making for my um, my daughter-in-law. They're already married, but they couldn't have the wedding because of COVID, so they're having the wedding after COVID. So I'll be making her wedding dress. So the studio is um, everything's accessible. Um, I have a beautiful industrial sewing machine um, that I won as an award when I was a student at Box Hill. I, w I won the student of the year fashion and that year I was it was lucky because normally they have a domestic sewing machine as a prize and that particular year they were changing all the industrial machines over yeah. and as a, a bonus they got an extra machine from the, the supplier and, I, and I, was, I was as shocked to have won that as I was to have won the 
the millinery design award because I mean, I was I was there because I had no clue, and I was in the audience. And um, I always thought, you know, the winners they always they always seat them at the end of the little row, you know. And they were talking <laughs> about the winner, and I'm looking at the end of the row and going, yeah, yeah, I can see yeah, that. That makes sense. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. <laughs> so and then it was me. I tell you, I fell over backwards. You know, it was um, it was so it's a beautiful machine. And I have quite a few domestic machines. My, my favourite domestic machine is a 1970 Janome. It's the first ever computerised sewing machine. And mum used to talk about this machine. She didn't have one years ago. She used to talk about it. She said it was the best sewing machine they ever made, but I, you know, she couldn't afford one at the time. Anyway, so I put an eBay watch, you know, 1970s Janome, and it came from Queensland and, and I got it delivered from Queensland to somewhere else and somewhere else to some, eventually got it home. Um, and now, so of course, I've inherited it, but mum was in aged care for the last few years. And so I've just spent $230 making, you know, getting it all juiced up properly nicely again. And the, the, the guy said, you know, the, you know, the repair guy said look you know you might spend 230 but it's the best machine she even said it's the best machine it stitches so evenly like a lot of domestic machines if you when you see them stitch when you look up closely it's not really perfect whereas this is like perfect stitching I have a felting machine um I did have a cover stitch machine but I've just sold that recently and I've got a couple of spares of domestic um, machines in case you know someone so I'm going to lend one to someone who's learning you know so yeah and my all my mannequin heads are in the shed um you know I've got a lovely a lovely shed <laughs> actually there's not like a shed a, a room out back all my mannequin heads are out the back so just in my working space is all working materials like I don't have to do a lot of storage of mannequin heads and things like that so yeah, I love it. And I've got a huge collection now of embroidery threads. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jeez, it, um, that's my new passion. <laughs> <laughs> and what's next on your millinery project list? Do you have something in the, in the pipeline? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, so I'm, I'm doing the, the Millinery Association of Australia have been invited to participate in Melbourne Fashion Week. Uh, I think it's the first the first time that we've been you know included, and there's 18 of us that have um, you know put our hands up to create something. The challenge with it is it has to be big, like bigger than what you know the normal woman's going to. Yeah, it's millinery sculpture is the break. Yeah, it? it's, it's a yeah. sculpture. And anyway, so I'm finding the engineering of my piece a challenge um because even though it's just a photograph or a still exhibition it still needs to be a hat so like you know it, at this stage it's got a little bit of wonk going on <laughs> so I'll have to correct that but interestingly enough I, I was so I was halfway through it so I'm three quarters of the way through now but I was halfway through it and I said to one of my sons Luke hi Luke I, don't, I hate my hat I said I hate my hat I hate it and he said What's wrong with it? I said, oh, no, it's gone in the wrong direction. I don't like it. I'm, I'm going to scrap it. And he said to me, mum, finish it. Finishing something in, while, during, while, while being in doubt will give you great resilience and perseverance. I thought, oh, God, he's so out of the mouths of young men, you know. So I thought, and he said, send me a photo. So I sent him a photo. And he goes, mum, it's, it's got potential, you know. So anyway... I thought I'll take his advice and I will, I'm going to finish this piece. And if I hate it at the end, well, then I'll start something else. But I'm going to finish this piece. Now that I'm three quarters of the way through it, I think, oh, okay, it's going to be all right. You know, it's, maybe Luke was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be yeah, Luke's, yeah, Luke and Bill, my, my two young boys, always give me advice on that. I, I miss when I was creating, when they were living at home, I used to finish a hat and go into their bedroom, because they shared a room. And, I, and I'd put on the hat and I'd say, what do you think? And they'd say, you know, Dame Edna, mum, Dame Edna. So I know that that meant it's not modern, so it, it, do something about it, you know. And then uh, my first ever competition piece for the Millinery Association Design Award, I had so much, when I finished it, I loved it, but I had so much doubt, so much doubt because 
it just looked so different to what I'd normally done and so different to what I'd seen others do. And I thought, am I going to be embarrassed by this piece? You know, and I showed my boys and they said, mum, it's so cool. And I'll, look, I think Philip Rhodes might have been the judge that year. Mate, you got it wrong. Seriously, I should have won. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. But I loved it and it, it didn't, it didn't, the, the judges didn't love it, but somebody did because it sold, I think I sold it for $750, which is still my most expensive piece that I've ever sold. So, you know, I was happy that someone saw in it what what I, you know, what I saw in it, but I was very <laughs> nervous. So now that they've moved out, I send them photos and say, what do you think, guys? And they, they give me good advice. So, yeah, they're my, my, my style, my style advisors. <laughs> well, it's been so lovely to chat hats you do today georgia thank you so much for being part of the millinery for podcast it's been oh, it's lovely. I'm, thank you so much for asking me and um i'm always a fan lauren you know that <laughs>